do that. Women today have too many thoughts. They're, they're, they have too many thoughts. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you could find a woman that's just simple and plain and whatever you want, honey, and here's your food, and I got the house clean, good and I'm good looking to boot, and I make more money than you, well, my God, you see how stupid I am? I'm a fucking yeah. idiot. There's a pattern throughout my life. Of, of taking good things and just crushing it, throwing them the fuck. Did away. you ever did you ever run around on the way while you were working at the college? I mean all No, the no, way. no, I didn't except at the end. And I did. Mm -hmm. At the end. Yeah. I did. Uh, some other staff members were and and as a matter of fact the the third highest in North Campus A V department, it would have been the director, assistant director, and then this guy openly had a student girlfriend. He was a man, in other words, married. And openly had a student girlfriend who was always with him and everything. Again, it was a different atmosphere back right. then. Now that that would be a, a felony, I think, right. for a I, I think for a felony, to, a teacher to have sex with a student is, is having sex with a person in custody is, is the same as. I think it would be a felony now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he wasn't a teacher. Before. Shortly after after that went south, and you, you got another one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like geopolitical views. <laughs> it's, it's only they had to stop. So the last thing that Transylvania deputy uh, John said to me, he said, <laughs> he was a little, you know, he said, uh, and thanks for allowing us to bend your ear. <laughs> he said, <laughs> I laughed. I said, thanks for letting me bend your ear. Thank you. <laughs> So after college, or after years Well, anyway, I fell into the clutches of this older woman who was eight years older than me, and she was a drug dealer. She was from a New York Jewish diamond family, that 54th Street diamond family, uh, uh, diamond folks that, that do these uh, million dollar deals with a handshake, and you know, you pass them, and they wrap the diamonds in paper, everyone's got their particular fold, and they hand them, you know, each other a million bucks in diamonds, and shake hands, and that's it. You can't get into it. You gotta, you gotta be born into it, and it's yeah. Jewish. Okay. What, what was her name? Uh, Paulette, and that's a, her. Her main name is Paulette Goldman. Paulette Goldman. And she was four years older than you. Eight. Eight years older than you. Mm -hmm. Okay. At any rate, so she was the misfit. They didn't know what to do with her. She was a woman. So they had bought her a house at the edge of Coral Gables, between uh, Coral Gables Coconut Grove boundary. Again, Coconut Grove at that time was real avant-garde, artsy fartsy artist colony. It's the Greenwich Village of... Uh, yeah, at Florida. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's, all that stuff has probably been torn down now, and big condos probably put on it. Back, back, back then it was a village, like Buckhead Village it used to be, right. but only much, much bigger, uh, much bigger. And all kinds of cool, hit people live there. So. And of course, Cold Gables, it was a very rich place, and this is right on the boundary. So uh, they bought her house, and she was going to the University of Miami majoring in sociology, and she didn't even manage, she, she managed to graduate with a, a, a bachelor's degree in sociology. Uh, but she was a drug dealer, mm -hmm. and mainly marijuana, right. ounce marijuana dealer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I moved in with her, mm -hmm. and boy, you know, that was. Not a good influence. Really? Yeah, well, she's the one that got me started on uh, the downs. I'd never had a, a, a down. We call them downs. Mm -hmm. Central nervous system depressive, so right. put it that way. Depress the functioning of your central nervous right. system. And back then, it was the hypnotics uh, in the form of uh, methoquilone hydrochloride, which is uh, quaalude, pyrus, sopor. You might remember. Well, you won't remember them, but sopor. Uh, and of course the barbiturates, mm -hmm. uh, they were still, barbiturates were still widely prescribed at mm -hmm. that time, just as sleeping pills. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Amitol, Secanol, uh, Amitol, Secanol, Nimbutol, and the combination of Secanol and, uh, Secanol and Amitol was Tuminol. It was blue and, blue and red, mm -hmm. caps like that, and they were considered the king, you know. They're, they're true narcotics, they're mm -hmm. true opium derivatives. What was the street name for them back then, do you remember? Downs. Downs, just yeah. Downs. Oh, oh, two and all were two. Mm -hmm. And then others were called by the colors they were. Uh, I think uh, reds. And reds, well there was reds, blues, and uh, right. yellows, uh, right. and by the color they were. Right. I. I wouldn't be surprised that it's impossible to get hold of a bar that you would these days. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, that I don't know if that's yeah. ever fashionable or anything yet. I don't, well, the, uh, the newer classes of antidepressant and, uh, and sleeping pills, uh, you know, but back then that was what people said. Oh, go take a sleeping pill. That's what they were talking about. Would you classify yourself as a hippie back then? Or? 
you know, by then, you know what the hippies were, it was just every kind of outlaw street person in the world. It's, I, I would kind of call it counterculture right. more than anything, misfits. And the whole country was a washing them. It was just a it was one thing to be there back then. That was the movement, kind of. Yeah, it, well, yeah, and you know, and of course, they themselves were wearing a uniform and doing a style, and uh, the, the country was just a wash in young people. If you already, well, you don't, but uh, in Atlanta in the late '60s and early '70s, they uh, since it's a regional capital, they you know they had uh, at the Piedmont Park, 10th mm -hmm. Street, and the Peach Street there. It was just a wash in them. The whole country was full of, of just raggedy ass young people hitchhiking and doing not much of anything and you know at that time we thought drugs were going to be legal within a few years yeah the, the amazing thing to me that i'm always shaking my head over is this great big huge cultural revolution uh, and we had in the 60s and 70s has almost utterly vanished utterly and it's back to the 50s now. Back in the 60s, if I said, hey, businessman, that would be a bad thing. Hey, Mr. Businessman, take care of business, Mr. Businessman. Mm -hmm. That would be a bad thing to say about someone. Mm -hmm. And now, what does every, every young person want to do? Get a MBA. <laughs> They're all just, you know, little geeks on, you know, keyboards pecking away. Right. You know, the Bible says, a meek shall inherit the earth. Well, I know what it means. It's just it's a fat fuck behind a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> right? You got ten times more powerful than me, and I'm a stud, man. I'm a stud. I can whip ass left and right, and they're more powerful, ten times more powerful than me. Fat fuck in a keyboard. Sitting in a keyboard. Yeah, I learned to type in the 60s in the Army when almost no man could type, uh, unless you're a reporter or a writer. But I won't type now. I call it women's work, <laughs> which shows I never make it on the outside, which is, you know, why I'm sitting here doing life and, and realizing it's the only place for me. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You could take me to the front door of this jail and say, go forward and say no more. I literally have to turn back around and walk back in here. There's nothing out there for me. And you see what my relationship with society as a whole is. I mean, it's only 5% of the people that have come forward so virulently and vehemently to, to knock me, but if the other 95% are the silent majority and don't, you know, they're not going to speak up, oh, I know Jerry Hilton, he's a, he's a great guy, you know, I know Hannibal Lecter, yeah, Hannibal, you know, Hannibal the cannibal, so, yeah. you know, I know Hannibal Lecter, he's a great guy, no, they're not going to say a goddamn thing. You'd be surprised people come forward and uh, talk pretty good about you. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not in the sense that they are 19 out of 20. Yeah. It's the people that they try to fuck with me, which yeah. are, are relatively rare. Yeah. But unfortunately, I, I put myself in a position where I have a high degree, a high amount of exposure to that type of people, and that is in dog situations. It's people with dogs. The average dog owner doesn't know jack shit about dogs. The average animal control officer doesn't know jack shit about dogs. Mm -hmm. They anthropomorphize. That means assigning human qualities to something. Anthropomorphic. Okay, and they assign human qualities to dogs, and what that means is, is that they want dogs to be like humans, which is be nice and get along. Well, that's not the way it is in the dog world, because when dogs talk to each other, you know, they quite often revert back to the wolf world, and the wolf world is more incredibly savage and brutal than you can ever imagine. Wolves are one of wolves are one of the the only animal that I know of, other than human beings, that will run down and run down and run down and run down and go and go and go after another member of their own species to kill it. Okay, just for the sake of killing? No, it's that uh, it's, it's, it's that if they get in their territory, rather than just run them out, if they can, they'll go and go. Other, other animals, it's just brief contest of strength, more or less, but, but a wolf pack, if they detect another wolf from outside their pack in their territory, they'll run it, and they'll run it, and they'll run it, and they'll run it, and if they can catch it, they'll kill it. An alpha female, you got your alpha male and alpha females in a pack, the leaders of the pack, okay? I've heard a while, a lot of biologists say this. They're, they're, they're studying them in yellow, they're back in Yellowstone now, so they're really getting good data in home wolf in the last 10 years. I heard a while, a lot of biologists on video say, you know, an alpha female may get up in the morning and 
kill her mother and run her sister off. That's how savage and brutal the wolf world is. And that's what dogs can revert, can revert back to when they're talking to each other. They don't understand, humans don't understand that in the dog world or the wolf world, there are no assault and battery laws. There are no murder laws. And quite often, there is no fear. Okay, imagine such a world mm -hmm. where there's no murder laws mm -hmm. and there's no fear. Mm -hmm. Which is why you see little chihuahuas getting killed all the time. They won't back down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? You just grab them one shake and they're gone, man. You all see little dogs get killed that way, you know. They won't back down. Yeah. No murder laws, no no aggravated assault, no assault battery laws, and quite often no fear. That's what the dog world is. And you've got to understand that and and be appropriately cautious. Mm -hmm. And humans don't understand that. And not only that, they they are aware that their their dog may fight and has fought and been in they're aware of that. But on the other hand, they can't control the dog. The dog isn't trained. They no one has enough time to spend with their dogs to begin with to get them properly trained. So that means the dog is going to have to lead his life at the end of the leash, and and he's jerking him around. And what they want to do is is let their dog run loose. And every everyone that the dog confronts, they want to say it's okay. He's friendly, you know. And <laughs> And, and they know it. I've had people. I've had people let their dogs confront me, and and fight the, and me fight the dogs, have them call the police on me, and then in the succeeding year, have seen that same person and that same dog get in two or three more incidents of the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A woman in Stone Mountain had two dogs 150 yards from me. I spotted them, and you're at a loss between trying to call. They were loose. And you're kind of conflicted as whether they're caller and warner or the fact is that as soon as they hear you call, the dogs are coming after you. <laughs> you, know, you don't really know what to do. I call to her, I say, yo, we've got a dog here, dog under control. Wow, dogs come right at me from a long way away, 150 yards away. Dogs split up. So I'm, I'm doing stick work on one. And when they split up, then you're going to have to use pepper if, if they split up. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to spray one at one if ever. At distance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily. Uh, it's hard to actually disable a dog with pepper. But uh, conversely, uh, dogs sense the pepper immediately. And, and it'll turn them, it'll turn them momentarily. If the dog, if the dog is determined, he'll, he'll come back. Uh, so, you know, you just take a shot at him. And I'm, I'm doing with stick work. They say, the thing about the stick or the baton is that it can be used in a graduated manner mm -hmm. and that it does command respect in most dogs. And that's the, the, the beauty of the whole thing is a graduated uh, manner as opposed to pepper or opposed to bullet. In other words, in fighting a dog or a human with a stick, my goal is to shape the situation. Mm -hmm. My goal in a stick fight with a human or a dog is not to make contact with a dog. A successful stick fight it's preventative. To me, mm -hmm. is shaping it with a stick mm -hmm. and not making contact. Mm -hmm. Because it takes it to a, a whole other level mm -hmm. when you make, especially with a human being. You get a human being with a stick, regardless of the situation, it's probably going to ruin your day, buddy. Mm -hmm. And it may not go your way either. Mm -hmm. Even though it always has. I've had the police call on me 30 times at least, mm -hmm. and no exaggeration in, in 17 years. No exaggeration at all. At least 30 times. I've had them called five times in Murphy Camera. I've had them called three times at Stone Mountain uh, alone. And those, that's eight right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, at least 30 times. And in every single time that the police were called on me, mm -hmm. the police have confirmed that I did not act unlawfully. And there's been a couple of times the police have written me a letter saying that I could press charges if I want. The one time it didn't go my way was not with a police officer. It was with animal control. Mm -hmm. Animal control is, are not police officers. And as a matter of fact, they don't know jet. They're just civilians with a uniform. It's all there. Police officers, the good ones, and most of them are good these days. Police work, of course, have become highly professionalized. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to Cab North in particular. Uh, Cab North has seen a lot of me. And uh, uh, police officers are trained to interrogate people mm -hmm. and to arrive at the truth. I found that police officers may not be able to tell if you're lying, but if you're telling the truth, they can tell. Mm -hmm. Generally, they may not catch you. Know, they may not can tell if you lie, but they can tell generally if you're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in every 30 times, with the exception of that animal control one, 
it went my way. And if it had not have gone my way, I was going to jail with assault with a deadly weapon, and that can be up to $20,000 bond in, in some mm -hmm. cases, okay? So mm -hmm. serious, serious charge, mm -hmm. okay? And every single time, I like this instance I was telling you about. I had to spray with a dog uh, stick work, it's just shaping the situation. And in other words, using in a graduated manner ranges from merely presenting the stick mm -hmm. and showing the stick to waving the stick to to all the way to contact. Right. Okay. To fainting with the stick or mm -hmm. fainting with the stick. Mm -hmm. You know. One thing I learned about fainting with a human being, dogs are real good with movement. They they pick up movement. Oh, like that, but humans don't. Right. And I learned with humans that if you're gonna faint with at a human, don't do it at combat speed because yeah, I'm too fast for them to see and it doesn't make an impression on them. So you're making a presentation you want them to do with Yeah, I mean I did that one time to a human, the guy that guy just after we were in the middle of a confrontation, he had a big loose male and et cetera. There was a female in heat present. It was a real melee. And, and so the kid, a nut, this is one of the few times that the guy wasn't bigger than me. Usually if someone, if you have a stick and handling yourself well, the guy's always going to be bigger than you. Well, this time the kid wasn't. He was only my size. And he comes right at me from 10 feet away, like boring right in on me. So I gave him a thing, you know, I, I did like that real quick just so and so that w what it is what happens is though the tip of the stick is going right at you and then coming back so you don't get the traversing motion you don't get the impression of movement that a traversing motion would mm -hmm. and as a result it was so quick that he didn't even see it but the, the point is that I goofed up and I just touched him right there mm -hmm. and he said because he, he didn't even see it, but he felt it, right? He said, I don't believe you did that. I don't believe you did that. Did you see him do that? And I looked behind me and his buddy was coming up behind me, which is another thing. Keep your focus wide when you're fighting. That's the hardest, that's a critique that you can always make, no matter how good of a fighter you are, stick fighter you are, or street fighter, whatever, you can, you can, you, you do these post after action critiques. And, and you break it down and try to analyze what you did wrong, what you did right, so you can learn from it, just mm -hmm. like you're doing. Right. You can always make the critique, yeah, I didn't keep my focus wide enough. You tend to fixate on the target. Right. Sure. You, you got to keep your focus wide, not only to look for other threats, but to look for witnesses. Witnesses, of course, put a whole different thing. If you have witnesses, uh, you'll act in some way, and if you don't, you, you may act another way. Right. But you act, typically, you want witnesses. Because they always lie, naturally. But again, the police can tell when I'm telling the truth. They come, and I tell them the truth, and it makes sense to them. And the other people are, are not telling the truth, and they're given a lot of excuses and rationales why they assaulted me. 